computer. Okay, so we want, I want to give a shout out to our colleague Dimitrov, who's, who was at every one of these, I think, until relatively recently, and hopefully he'll get a chance to watch the video and, you know, things will start improving. Um, so for now, let's go ahead and pass this off to David, and he can do an introduction, a quick intro of himself, and get started on his presentation today. You've seen the blurb, let's just go right into it. Um, um, particularly what um, spins my wheels just now is a lot about neurodiversity. And I realize that I haven't paid enough attention to this for the whole of my long teaching career. Um, and particularly advantages. And I think it's neglected in most areas of business, but it's particularly so I think in public relations. Um, and this is Neurodiversity Week. I didn't plan it that way. And what I'm particularly interested in is the advantage sides of uh, neurodiverse. Uh, are you getting a background noise from this? No. I'm no. not here. That's good. It might be because Margalit has her computer on too close yeah. to you. Maybe she should move away a little bit further or uh, turn her volume down. My, that happens to Michael and Just me. turn the volume down a little. No, no need. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'll return to that, um, to I'm true. Um, this is a rather odd one when I discovered a lot of my friends and colleagues. So what I've done is set this up as a two-part lecture. And the first part is particularly designed, it's something I've been keen on for a long time, but it's particularly designed for COVID times. And uh, I want to open up uh, the art of the possible. So this is designed, you know, for Zoom working and all kinds of working. And I do a lot of consulting as well, and I found it particularly useful uh, around uh, this. So Whenever we start teaching, consulting, talking, dialoguing, anything, the initial conditions are vital. So one of the things that I do is set up conditions whereby everyone must feel comfortable speaking and everyone must be listened to. Michael does it quite naturally in having everyone, but really uh, I can't stress how important that is to get a, an inclusive um conversation. And the two key questions that I'm running my life by now, and I run in all my classes, all my consultancies, are both asked at least three times. The first one is, what do you do well? So we won't, I would normally put you out in groups, but just have a think, what do you do well in your life as a student, as a lecturer, as a parent, as whatever. What do you do well? Think of at least three things you do well. Anyone not got three things? You can do self-esteem courses if you can't manage three things. Okay, and how do you feel now? Because one of the key things is to start off an emotional uh, groundswell. And whenever you ask someone, what do you do well and listen to them, you start to get positive. And this can be tremendous when you're doing change management programs. And also if you appreciate what people do well, they're then more likely to give you an honest answer to what could you do better. So this is a very simple way, but again and again, whenever I'm, um, you know, when I get people do presentations in class, um, the class asks, what did they do well? What else did they do well? What else did they do well? And just to inculcate this as a habit is uh, enormously helpful and sets up good conditions for uh, some decent dialogue. So I'm very strong on telling people uh, of being self-reflective and seeing where you come from. And uh, I haven't changed that much. I've lost hair and lost body mass and all sorts of things, but I haven't changed my positions 
that much uh, uh, over the years. And I go back to uh, my colleague, Debe Shish, um, and both of us in reconfiguring public relations, we're two of the few people who constantly declare where we're at and what we're trying to do. We have interests in you and we'll and I look back to the, the book, I'd actually for, lost it, Deba she sent me. Um, and what we did, we said it resituates PR as part of a wider movement towards more regionally and internationally inclusive enterprise, foregrounding equity concerns, environmental and social sustainability. That's where we were at right from the start. And we were very clear on that. And Debashish has moved it tremendously. I strongly recommend his book on climate futures. And I'll refer to some other things as we go through. My own personal one has to be to make PR less insular. Um, I got so fed up in the Grunig years of examining our uh, things. So reconfiguring public relations was like an exorcism. Uh, I went round um, Brown Planet Grunig. To, so that I never needed to do it again. And uh, I've left the history chapter for you, the students to read for this because I wanted to get us beyond. And I think that um, the insularity is still there, but I think it's lessening. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I, I think that also makes for greater interdisciplinarity. And I also want to open possibilities through exciting ideas. When I got to university, I wanted to live here. I met interesting people. I got a grant to write books and talk to interesting people. And then I got ahead and I ended up in uh, committees where it was as exciting as watching Dag End Harden. There was no excitement, there was nothing there. And I think if we lose that excitement, then, uh, we're, we're doing ourselves and others uh, uh, an injustice. And today I'm particularly going to focus about hacking into history uh, with a view of refashioning the past. And for the same thing, create better business, better climate, better cultural, ecological and social futures. So I've never been short of ambition. And there's a lovely Muppets quote, which um, I got. And uh, one of my heroes is a guy called Jeremy Black. And he's published, I think, probably about over 30 books in history. Very specialist, very general and everything. And I think that's clear with the muse of the historians. And he talks about historiography. And historiography is how we look at history. And <clears throat> his argument and my argument is that we need to contest the past to claim the future. So in reconfiguring public relations, we um, had a go at, at two-way symmetric and all the idiocies that entailed. Uh, sorry, Jim, I know you're um, less biased against the, the Grunig time than I am, but um, I think it had to be contested to get a different kind of future. And one of the things that happened with the Grunig years was public relations tried to do everything internally. We tried to do our own history, our own dialogue, our own stuff, instead of learning from other places. So we neglected a lot of communication. So a preview of part one, um, appreciative inquiry. I want to define it, apply it to change, and open what I started with, the art of the possible. I think right now we need to open possibilities. COVID has closed a lot of things down. And um, I, I think with, understandably, but I think that we need to find ways to get excited about futures. And I want to show an early uh, AI intervention in action. And I want to give you some experience of it and some possible ways of using AI after today. Anyone recognize the picture? That's supposed to be appreciation. It's the Glastonbury Festival, but never mind. It doesn't matter. So uh, I, like most communication people, I always go back to definitions. So the two parts of appreciative and inquiry, appreciate. The verb, to value, 
recognize the best in people or the world round about us, to affirm past and present strengths. That's why I start with what do you do well? What else do you do well? What else do you do well? Successes and potentials. And to perceive those things that give life, health, vitality, excellence to living systems. And appreciative also uh, to increase in value. If you've had a house in Sydney, I think you know appreciation um, there. And I think it's true of people. The more you appreciate them, the more they grow in value. And I think this is uh, sometimes neglected. And the second is to explore and discover, to ask questions, to be open to seeking new potentials and possibilities. So I love asking people, what do you do well? Um, what's the most exciting thing happening in your life? What good things are happening in your life? I ran one uh, workshop and I was teaching this and the guy said, oh, I really was inspired by your talk. And I went home and I asked my wife when she came in the door, what good thing happened in your life today? And she said, you've been on a course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but he said then we started to ask our children what good thing happened in your life today to reorient them to plant the in the brain this was a question that uh, to be asked so we we'll look at appreciative questions it's a strengths-based approach i won't go in there its focus is humans at their best it starts by helping people to define what they want to explore as art does so find the art of the possible in organizations. Remember, every system works to some degree, even if excess, exceptional moments. As a, I know a number of you have done consultancy, and many of you as students and lecturers have been in classes which have not been life-enhancing experiences. But the appreciative inquiry tries to seek out the good bits, try to to squeeze the juice from it. Um, so discover what is working and following that to expand what's, what's going to happen. And exploring what is possible can yield information that is useful, can be applied and get buy-in. One of my mantras is no one resists their own ideas. And if people, you can get people to believe your ideas are their ideas, it's not good for the ego, but boy, it gets things done. And the, the, the secret to change management is simply that no one resists their own ideas. So if you can get people moving. And also, if you stir up what is possible, it starts to open up ways that don't focus on how it was done in the past. Because when you enter consultancy, people want to tell you to the death what happened in the past. So it stirs up provocation about what might be. So um, I hope this works. Uh, I want to show a bit of this and stop it and ask what you would do. So let's see, uh, if you can't hear it, let me know. Can't hear it. Just a second. The start went missing on me. Sorry, this was, I'm not stuck in a permanent loop. You want me to try to play the link? There sure. was an old hotel that was failing to, Oh shit, let it go just now. I can stop you and restart you.
Okay. Sorry about the the glitch at the start, but was anyone everyone able to see and get the story? I didn't. Oh, I didn't follow it. I didn't follow a hotel. They trained the staff. People were happy. Did you see the cartoon? Good. No. Didn't. We could see the the movement of the cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, basically, the story was it was crap. And instead of doing the usual management stuff, they took them and put them up at a five star hotel and made them appreciate what was good about the five star hotel. And when they'd done that, uh, they had to feed it back to the hotel and they fed it back to the hotel. And um, then the hotel was delighted. The staff there were delighted and treated them to a banquet. And then when they went back home without any further instructions, they were able to raise up to a four-star hotel where they were. So it was by appreciating the good they had come to do it. And I found this in, when I'm working with um, particularly, you know how you enter some organizations and it's just toxic. So it's finding what is good and um, building, getting that as a foundation. So what I would like to do, um, yeah, we should have time, is um, I'll ask Michael to put you in pairs in a moment mm -hmm. to think uh, for all the students, um, to think back your experiences on the course and reflect on one of the best times in it, a high point. Because we're looking at how to build trust, a climate of sharing and attending. So we start by choosing a high point. And for my fellow lecturers, it can be a high point in your teaching or anywhere in life. So what we want to do is think back on one of the high points. So if you take a minute to think back on one of the high points, um, and then we're going to share the story when we put you into peer groups. What happened? When did it happen? Who was involved? Just to really explore roundabout what made this a successful experience. So um, has anyone not got a high point experience? Okay, Michael, can I ask you to use your superb skills to okay. pair us up? How long are I keeping people in groups? Um, so let's say four minutes and if you could, uh, Take turns, two minutes each. Okay, just a second. I think I need 12 breakout rooms if I'm pairing people up. Two minutes, uh, sorry, two minutes total or two minutes? Uh... Two minutes each. Okay, so four so, minutes. So, you know, uh, okay. share, share your story, then ask the other person. Okay. I think it's set. Do I need to stop sharing? Um, I'm not sure. Are people disappearing into rooms or not? I not can't yet. See. We should get a message. I think I might need to stop sharing. Well, so let me stop and see if that happens. Okay, let me try this again. Uh, rooms assigned to... Let me try it one more time. Break out rooms. Um, all right, sorry, I was not wasn't prepped on the on this. Close all rooms. Let me try this again. Uh, recreate, assign automatically. Here we go twelve rooms, and open all rooms. Okay, that should work. And who am I with? I think we ended up with a room of three. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm not sure what happened, but I figured I'd, you're the only one left without a room, so I'd jump in with you. Uh, okay. Um, you want to start? You want me to start? Um, you go for it. Okay. So um, we were sharing something about a, a class experience, I think, that we, uh, that we enjoyed or that we liked. Um, as a student, I guess, taking the standpoint of the student, I would say that um, I used to not like, when I was a student, I used to not like the whole introduce yourself sort of thing. And I was always sort of uncomfortable and nervous about that. But I think that that changed sort of down the road. And I, I came to appreciate that that was an opportunity to sort of get to know the other people. And even though it was sort of intimidating when, you, when you're young and you first start out, um, it, it came to be something that I sort of took for granted in my program. We always did that. Every class did that. And, I, and then, so I would say that was something that I appreciated, that I came to um, enjoy about the classroom experience. Yeah, no, so, so for, for me too, teaching has, I mean, I've been teaching for such a long time now, um, and uh, I tend to take provocative, what might seem to be provocative uh, positions, just to you know, shake people out of their comfort zones to think um, differently. And um, some of the high points have been that, at least some, not all, but some students definitely take that on board and therefore, refine their own questioning abilities that they don't just take everything for granted or um, fall into the traps of assumptions. And especially because in my research too, I take critical positions, you know, um, just to get them to say, just because you read something or see something, you know, doesn't mean that that has to be taken at face value. And um, that has definitely been a, a high point for me, especially to see my own PhD students taking that questioning approach to um, life and research. Yeah, yeah, I actually, I do the same sort of thing. I mean, I try to, mm -hmm. I try to ask hard questions mm -hmm. that they have to think about, you know, and, and then I sort of, you know, I, I sort of force them. You have to really push students a bit these days, I think, Yeah. to get them to, to participate. Yeah, I don't, you know, make them uncomfortable, but I think that is uh, useful as you make them start thinking about those things. And then right. I think, you know, years later, or, you know, sometimes a year later, sometimes five years later, when one of those students comes back to you mm -hmm. and tells you about, you know, like yeah. that, that was the thing. Yeah. That is certainly a high point. Yes. When students come back and say that they actually opted for a particular career and not go down the path of who was paying the most, you know, it just makes a day that something has kind of stuck in. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I've had a couple of students over the years who've sort of come, you know, come to me for, and I've had, I guess, many students, right? But it seems like, you know, 100 students come to you for, come to you for advice and 99 of them never take it. But, you know, there's that one student who, who sort of does what you suggested. And, you know, the next thing you know, you know, I had a student one time, I, I, he asked me, what should I read? You know, and so I told him, you know, read The Economist, you know, read five mm -hmm. newspapers. And I gave him this whole list of things he should do. And, you know, like six months later, he'd, you know, he'd subscribed and he was, you know, reading all this stuff and he just had this completely different view of the world after sort of, you know, learning about it. And I think that's really a rewarding thing. It is, yes, yeah. Also to get them out of, you know, referencing the same old things, you know, to look beyond, I mean, read novels, for instance, you might get some insights which some of the academic articles might not actually give you and it'll broaden your horizon. So, you know, just to look, even in terms of referencing, go beyond the usual suspects really to get insights from other sources. Okay, I think mm -hmm. I have to stop us now because I'm yep, sure. So Good. let me close all the rooms, see if this yeah. is what we're looking for. Sure. I'll talk to you in a bit. Okay, I think it worked. Mine didn't. I went into a room with no one and then I left and came back and Arme was here, but no one came into my room, Michael. I'm sorry. So I wasn't able to share my high points, <laughs> which is probably okay. You can share with all of us. Okay, well, hopefully it worked for everyone else. I had that, somebody else had the same thing. I went into a room because I saw that, I thought everybody was paired up except for one person. So we went and talked together. I think you get a minute to come back. Oh no, we have 
13, 14, 15. Well, we went, but um, 4, 8, 12, 13. Participants, 15. Okay, I think everybody's almost back. Yeah. Okay, so if you showed up and you didn't know what was happening, we were trying to pair people up. So you were supposed to wound up in a room with somebody else. So I'm going to let David take over, take back over now. Um, this is one I found particularly when you're running seminars regularly, that um, there's usually one person presenting. And many times the students actually, it's when they present that they start to get a high point. And um, it was very useful. I do some volunteer work with a society for, uh, that has um, people working with uh, kids at risk. And one of the things in this is um, in telling the story and identifying when it happened, we were able to get a time span for if you had a, a breakthrough before five weeks, well, it would be unlikely you get a breakthrough in the first five weeks. And if you didn't have one by week seven, it, it was probably a sign you needed to change. So it's a simple way of building up trust having shared experiences, creating joint stories, and working from the positive thing in that. Any questions or comments on that? Okay. Um, oh, I'll need to share screen again. I'm not used to having, not having control. Well, you have control, but... Kim, when Kim did her presentation, she wanted to insist on using her Zoom and having complete control. I said no. Okay, are you now getting my PowerPoint back? Yeah. Yes, okay. So it's just a, a basic way of, of working some stuff up because I wanted to do some practical stuff. And this is ways of doing it. And it's also looking um, for the future to take away how be able to build in this experience? Um, if you were able to build an experience, how did you do it? How might you do in the future? Okay, so I'll switch on to what I promised now, which was the value of entertaining liars, counterfactuals, fiction, and PR history. Um, so you can see immediately by the, well, it's interesting. I trust most people know that that's uh, Big Ben in the Houses of Parliament, and uh, it looks like the Nazis won the Second World War. So we're looking at the use of uh, lies and by liars. And I want to, for this part, I want to explain the title. Look at some entertaining liars, fact and fiction. And then I want to examine what history is. What is history? and mainly through a section of cover stories. You can tell a lot about the book by looking at uh, the stories. Some facts, icons, and histories, and finally some killer apps for dealing with uh, PR histories. So um, does anyone not know what that is? Oh, well, someone tell me what it is if you can. It's another one of the Nazis winning the war, which when Trump was in power, when I showed this in, uh, at a conference, it got quite a, 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 a drag back. But I want to go to uh, humanity's liar paradox in history. This reputed to originate with a uh, accretion called Eumenides, his statement that all creatures are liars, which is the same paradox as I am lying. And that paradox is at the heart of history, since all accounts of the past must necessarily be false. If you stop and think about your own day and give a history of the day, even in immense detail, there would be things you, you would exclude um, consciously, perhaps unconsciously. History can never speak for itself. People have to make it up and it has to be partially subjective. What matters to one person doesn't matter to another. And similarly, we'll see that this happens with histories. So to take the liar paradox on, all storytellers, academics, comedians, historian, PR practitioners are liars. And there's been a big movement in history over the last 
20, 30 years. Um, a very good book, second edition uh, out of Australia says, is history fiction? And looks at the overlaps and contradictions between uh, history writing and fiction writing. And one of the world's most famous history historians, Simon Sharma, uh, talks about dead certainties, that we can't find reliable history anymore. We have to work with unreliable history in awareness of what we're doing with it. And um, some enterprising PR marketing partner, well, an enterprising PR marketing partner says, trust me, I'm lying. The tactics and confessions of a media manipulator. And uh, it's quite an interesting book in as much as he, he attempts to make transparent how media manipulation works, how to um, fight them in an early way. And he was quite early on to um, social media and then come back in five years later uh, when we were getting into Trump times to uh, look at the, 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 false, the false news. And trust me, I did start this title, Michael can back me up, uh, before the pleasant times in Ukraine. So I would like to have a better try at trying to show you a clip. As Putin prepared before uh, announcing it to the world to move into uh, Ukraine, this was happening in Ukraine. So let's hope this works without embedding. We tested it and it worked the other day. Yep. But I tested the other one and it worked. David, we can't hear anything. David, you have to change the setting on the sound in um, Zoom to be able to play YouTube clips and things like that from your device to the to broadcast it. David, did you get that? Okay, let's see if I can stop that. David, when you share screen in the bottom left corner, there's a share sound box. Sorry? In the share, when you click on the share screen, the green arrow, at the bottom of your screen, the dialogue box comes up showing you your slides. In the bottom left hand corner, there's a share sound uh, box to check, might help. Uh, I'm not sure I can do that. Let me do it. Sorry. Um, let me come out. Oops, sorry. I started screen sharing by accident. I was looking at what. Yeah, I think you need to do that, Michael. I'm not. Well, that's that's what I was just trying to do, but then it took yeah. over and, and brought my screen up. I'll need to stop sharing I for think, you to do. It. Yeah, stop sharing and then start sharing and click that box. Uh, okay. I've never had to do it when I have control. Probably you don't either, because when you have control, it's automatic. Yeah. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. Sorry, I should have noticed that on share screen. Um, let's let's go back a bit. How's this doing? Vasily Petrovich Galaborotka. Доброе утро, господин президент. Привет, как дела? Серьезный день, ребята. Как настроение? Sorry. We're not seeing any images, we're just hearing the sound now. We're seeing your screen share. Yeah, so I uh, maybe need to get out of this and go back in.
You might need to share desktop instead of the PowerPoint window. You might have seen... How's that? Здрасте. Василий Петрович Голобородько? Still not moving. We're just seeing a still slide. Доброе утро, господин президент. Okay. I checked it and thought it was working, but let's abandon it. Anyway, you've got the um, location on there. And the story is as, uh, let's see if we can get this one out. Are you now able to see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the story is um, how a satire comedian became a president. And the questioning from the BBC was that what would happen? And actually, it was very entertaining lies by telling the truth that come through. And now, as we know, he's um, turning into one of the best political communicators we've ever seen and having a tremendous um, bar out of it. So starting off as a comedian and saying a lot of the same lines. So uh, what I want to get in this is a way that we're extending out the normal boundaries between truth and fiction and how some, if we entertain in the sense of um, appreciate, try to follow uh, certain lies, what's in them, they have the potential to make a uh, real life change. And I think without um, Zelensky as present, president, Ukraine would have had a much tougher uh, battle not that it doesn't have one already. So the, um, the seeming satire show is actually having a huge impact on what's there. So I think it's important to entertain liars. And uh, I hadn't anticipated it happening to this extent, but I think it's one of the best examples I've ever encountered. David, can I ask a question? Yep, anytime. Okay, and then also um, somebody had noted if you could uh, maybe when you get a chance or at the end drop in those links into the uh, chat box so that people can cut. Ah, uh, sorry, yeah. I, but um, so this idea of we, of saying that all basically all storytellers are liars, mm -hmm. if I'm understanding what you're saying. But I mean, if we extend that, that applies to all videos are lies and all you know all stories, all messages are lies. But there's, then there's no way except for what you experience. And we know that people have different experiences of the same events. So how is it, why is lying the, the concept that we go with? Well, the thing is that otherwise we start to try to get official truths. You know, when you get a president like Trump, who's a serial liar, then it becomes very hard. So what it is, is to open up our um, perceptions to looking at what we would normally not question and what we would normally question. So while the president was um, acting the satirical character, he was still putting real messages across. So all lies, but not everything they say is a lie. And this is one of the problems with the fake news thing mm -hmm. that, um, there is a huge amount of subjectivity. Not all lies are the same in the sense that some have greater credibility. And it's actually a gigantic issue with vaccines. You know, we have, uh, as many places have, a strong anti-vaccine movement. Fortunately, in New Zealand, it's small. But it's to try and get, and sometimes the satire can be the way to uh, win public assent for the truth, to... Um, get it through. But the, the, the thing is that I think with certain preset biases towards news as being factual, towards presidents as telling the truth, towards satirists as telling lies. And I want to entertain wider possibilities. I want us to explore um, different ways of getting there. I was a big fan of the West Wing. And what happened when George Bush, who now, I, after Trump, you actually miss George Bush, um, that they put up a fictional president who would do the right thing. And you could see the actions uh, that are there. And this gets into uh, public 
uh, consciousness. And a show like Veep starts to make people aware of discourses and the different regimes of truth and starts to look at how we make the decision. We look at our perceptual equipment, we look at the biases we've lined up. And I want to try and find ways of uh, getting, uh, hacking into this so that people can explore things in a different fashion and find positive elements within seemingly unlikely settings and find negative elements within seemingly positive settings. Does that help a bit? Yeah. Anyone else anything? Please, any. One of the things I say, there are no uh, dumb questions. There, there may be dumb answers, but there are no dumb questions. So please feel free to ask or comment at any point. OK, Marianne, do you want to ask that? Yes, yes. So um, so thanks. I was just I mean, responding to also um, Mitchell's um, comment about whether history is false. Um, with all these resources. I wonder whether it was appropriate to say it, that objectivity, the, you know, is a myth and rather if one, how, if we, we discount everyone's lived experience as a lie, then what are we going to be basing anything on? It's just, uh, unless I, I did not pick up um, David's Mm. angle about satire and using it as entertainment so but i'm a bit so if if i did please enlighten me a bit more David. <laughs> yeah thanks for that well it, it's the paradox that you know the cretian says all cretians are liars and if he's telling the truth so he can't tell the truth and at the same time maintain it so uh, when the pr marketing writer says trust me i'm lying that there's a contradiction within it. And by implication, a satire show is not telling the truth, but it can have contain more truths than a news broadcast. So it's working with the paradox. There's not a simple um, true-false dichotomy. I'm not saying everything's a lie, but there are ways in which we have to navigating what, what is true uh, is um, quite difficult in a lot of uh, very important areas, as we've seen, especially around uh, COVID, when we're looking at uh, stories about what is, is right and how we decide it. And what I want to do is, is for, to continue in this is, is to look at how they do it in history, because I think that history is one of the key things where they've got a way of weighing evidence and um, presenting elements to make things persuasive and open up different ways of perceiving the present and the future. I hope that helps a bit. It's a bit of an exaggeration to say uh, everyone's lying, but everyone does lie at some point, and, but not everyone lies all the time and probably no one. Even Trump tells the truth occasionally. Oh, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> well, OK, I stand corrected on that one. Framing is a different story, though. OK, so let me move on to history and see. But hold that question, and we'll return to it, because it's a good one. So I'm going back to an old set of lectures from 1961 by a guy known as E.H. Carr, Edwin Hallett Carr. And he was revolutionary in my understanding of history when I read his book in the 60s. It was a set of, well, we'll turn to. It. He said, it used to be said that facts speak for themselves. This is, of course, untrue. The facts speak only when the historian calls on them. It is he who decides to which facts to give the floor and in what order or context. And this was to attack the standard view that was coming through history consists only of facts. Historians create facts. And Hallett, uh, Hallett Carr argued 
that in fact, what makes a fact is that when it appears in a historical fact, it's when it's published by uh, books by at least two respectable historians. So it's the professional community that decides what is a historical fact. So this book is, had a very long uh, checkered history and I've called it post-perennial perspectives because there's some truths about history that last through time. There are things that happen and there are things that don't happen. Um, but how do we know about it? And history needs to be historicized. And I took this book as a way of lo looking at this because the time when the history is written is very important. So in 61, uh, E.H. Carr gave this lecture and it was picked up and it was republished in <clears throat> 2002. Um, with, uh, uh, I don't know if you recognize it, but it's Magritte's illustration, The Mind's Eye. And Carr made history much more problematic <coughs> within the, the genre. And he still continues. That was a 40th anniversary edition. So there's some truth there that has lasted. And also everyone uh, excuse me, I had an operation and I got some um, anesthetic that screwed my throat up a bit. So if I'm even harder to understand than usual, that's why. <laughs> and uh, the, what's happened is his car has disturbed, you know, others have done it too, but he was the most influential in disturbing this. And he's, he's the one who gets history needs to be historicized. And that is not something that's done uh, very frequently in public relations history. Uh, and 2002, the key word was added by David Canadine. And what is history now? Because history changes with generations and with times. What counts as history? What doesn't count as history? And one of the big changes from the 60s was the, the people excluded from history were starting to enter. The subalterns, women were hidden from history. Um, and now there's a history of gambling, of uh, horse racing. There are histories of almost any, everything. So instead of being kings and queens and political things, so history itself changes. And one of the readings I suggested for the course is actually an Australian book, <clears throat> again called What is History Now?, which is um, how the past and present talk to each other. It's a collection of um, historians in Australia talking about it. And ironically, it's E.H. Uh, e. Carr's great-granddaughter, Helen Carr, who's actually writing it. So every generation needs to ask, what is history now? And I think we need a really good um, PR book on what is PR history now? Because PR history in the past has got a bit solidified and stuck. And I think there's a lot of space to um, expand it and move it out. And there's a lot more techniques that could be used that could help it. So let's look at the contestations. I don't know if you know this, uh, the, the story of Fearless Girl. It's, uh, it's coming out of the Hidden from History and the big debate over statues. Bob Heath's written very well on uh, uh, the destruction of icons, roads must fall, the pull down of statues of colonialists and slave owners. And this one started initially in um, the financial district, where the fearless girl was created to stare down the, the charging bull from the bull market of Wall Street. And of course, when you pull down statues or put up new statues, the contestation often becomes public. Become aware that history is not found, history is contested, history is fought for. 
you have to, if women are to get into history, a lot of women had to, to struggle. They had to struggle to get the vote and they had to struggle to get into history. And even then it was not acceptable that she was actually shifted out. And the last I read, she was actually looking up at the New York Stock Exchange, which I think is much less impressive than, than staring down the bull. But it also connects with real life facts, although it's an artifact. Um, the days when only men sat on US boards are nearly extinct, but the pace at which our boards are moving towards gender parity has slowed. And it's likely to be, and I think this is optimistic, at least a decade before they're evenly split. So we're looking back through history, we're looking at the tools of history, we're looking at the icons of history, we're looking at historical icons to open up possibilities. And Fearless Girl is one of my personal favorites. Another of my um, interests is chaos theory. And um, Niall Ferguson was one of the key writers. Winston Churchill actually wrote a virtual history, which is a what if history. What if the historical fact had been different? And Ferguson asked, what if there'd been no American war of independence? What if Hitler had invaded Britain? What if Kennedy had lived? What if Russia had won the Cold War? And I want to look at this as a way of helping us see the future. If the past could have been different for even a small thing, then the present might be different and the future can certainly be different. Within the historiography literature, it's also known as Cleopatra's nose. The story being that if Cleopatra had a horrible hooter, that Antony would never have fallen for her and there would have been a whole set of different histories. Um, and this opened up a whole lot of ways of looking. And the questions asked are very critical because they have a bearing on the present. So a bullet misses a target in Sarajevo, maybe no First World War. There's a story that a would-be Austrian painter gets into the Viennese Academy. If Hitler had been accepted as an artist, he might not have gone on to found the Third Reich. If Lord Halifax had become the Prime Minister, Churchill might not have helped in the Second World War. And it's these seemingly minor twists of fate on which world-shaking events might be hinged. And that's why I like this. We're looking to see that history can be changed with very, very small things. And it's very akin to chaos theory where we're looking at um, a butterfly flapping its wings in Brazil can um, create a tornado off Texas. And we're looking at what were the minor events in his seemingly minor events that might have changed. Science fiction does this a lot. Um, but now there's a whole school, Counterfactuals has now got quite an established school within history. Many people still totally dismiss it, but I think it's an interesting way for opening possibilities. Um, so Andrew Roberts has two collections, what might have been, and you can see by putting the SWAT sticker in. And um, I like Catherine Gallagher's title, telling it like it wasn't, that what if it had been different, how would we live today? and the uh, uh, areas around that, to get how um, what happens is fragile. We don't know at the time what the key decisions will be. And at the same time, we've stretched our lives even further so that now there's a movement called Big History and Jeremy Black's in there again. The story of life, the universe and everything. It's impossible to know with any certainty what happened at the origins of the universe. There was no one there, obviously, but whether the Big Bang's accurate or not. But in stretching back to get the imagination of where we come from, it also helps us to see how we are now and how we might be. The Israeli historian 
um, has written a very famous book called Species, looks at how humankind evolved. And if his, if you buy into his view, it changes how we're behaving in the present and what kind of future possibilities there might be there. So there, um, there are ways by stretching, by encompassing a much wider background, there's a chance of seeing uh, different options for the future. And now, partly to answer um, Marianne, my exaggeration, I go to um, a handbook of strategic public relations and Clark Kaywood's daughter, who works in storytelling actually, says, all stories are true, some stories actually happen which might be a much less emotive way to do it. Um, and stories can carry a truth, even if they didn't happen. There are a lot of myths which are around, which are, are, are there. And I want to alert us to this. And as public relations practitioners, if, if journalism is the first draft of history, then the press release <laughs> is often shaping journalism. So public relations is a, a, a much neglected role within history and starts to put out. We saw that in the, the first Iraq war. We've seen a number of occasions which retrospectively, we can see how false truths were established. And these are truths which have helped nations go to war. So entertaining liars. Now, I come back to Jeremy Black because he has much to do with what I uh, plan to do in this. He says, other pasts, different presents, alternative futures. So Black performs a what if analysis to show how little it takes to change the world's fate. What might have happened in Wuhan if this had been um, identified early and shut down quicker instead of going to a super spreader event. And I must give credit to my colleague Debishish Munshi for introducing me to the Ministry of the Future for the Future, which is a science fiction novel by <coughs> a well-known science fiction writer. And it's been praised as the best science fiction, non-fiction novel I've ever read, which is capturing the um, paradox again. Debishish got me into this and I, uh, he's actually used um, Robinson's work in his uh, collection on climate futures. But it's highly credible and helps us to see what might happen if there was a Ministry for the Future is quite credible that it would take this path is something very different. And uh, I found it one of the most powerful and scary and also encouraging reads. So instead of going into the history to enact the future, Robinson goes into the future to hack back into the present. So we're all time travelers, but we're looking at ways to do it. And I think one of the things that help us is to extend the fact fiction spectrum. It's not an absolute polarity opposites, which might answer your question more um, accurately, Marianne, that, you know, not everything is lie, but there's a spectrum and it's very hard to see where things lie on a spectrum. So I want to um, look by um, killer apps for PR history. Um, I've done a lot of work on, sorry, anyone, any? Um, PR history. And I think that one of the things that uh, needs to be attended to very closely is start with why. When I set out in a lecture or a book and with Debbie Sheesh as well, we say where we're coming from, what, what we have interests, we're trying to do things. This is interested, committed uh, writing and lecturing. And I think that the, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, his history was always motivated by ethically 
and politically engaged question, what is to come? What are you wanting? It's always been in the service of an engaged attempt to open the future to differing in some essential way from the past, of a humanity not being sentenced to reiterate the past, and especially past atrocity. And this is um, terrifying at the moment, because I think we have to support Ukraine, but nationalism as a way of understanding the world has had pretty disastrous consequences. And I think we need to get beyond national histories. And that's why big history, which looks at the planet, the environment, the climate, um, from a scientific perspective is particularly valuable. Um, historiography itself, I think that before anyone writes PR history, they should read some, uh, some more history and some more historiography. And we need history that's capacious enough uh, and comparative enough, so that we're not looking at just the West, just male history, um, to come through. And we need, as E.H. Carr did, to, um, thanks, to historicize historical research itself. Right now, although Ukraine is a massive issue, the um, survival of the planet is probably the largest single issue. And historical research needs to attend to that. And also be clear on the importance of upfront value commitments. Too many public relations history books are, um, are written as though they're neutral, as though they're, sorry, I do need to take some sips, um, as though they're just finding history, that history exists out there. It doesn't. Everyone who goes into history and the history we choose to take promotes a certain social, political, environmental element. So we need to choose with care um, what we study, how we study, and we need to be open about it. So my last four would be to entertain lies. I think to understand history, to understand science, we also need to look at science fiction. To understand history, we need to look at historical novels, um, films, TV shows, as well as going in the archives. I think we've got to own our own personal stake, speak from a vision and an openly interested standpoint. Be self-reflectful, mindful, and as transparent as possible. Try to declare where you're getting your sources, what they're coming, what you're trying to do, uh, why you're trying to do it, any possibilities that are wrong with them. And last but not least, to enlarge and extend the spectrum of historical inclusion. History now has constantly widened so that we've got more and more people, sentient beings from um, working class history was introduced, women's history was introduced, and environmental history was introduced, big histories looking at the whole history, and world history beyond nature, so beyond nations, so that we get out to look at species history. And with that, I want to come back to my beginning, because this is still um, Neurodiversity Week. And I think the world needs neurodiversity. Um, unusual times call for unusual thinking. And neuro-minorities often cope better and also um, have different perspectives. They offer innovations. And that clip, uh, it's a bit small for you to see, but it looks at the positive sides of um, what are seen as previously been seen as disabilities. And to encourage PR, I'll look at um, the story of autism. It's not a history of autism, but autism didn't exist as history till someone invented the word. Asperger's only happened when Asperger made some observations of the world. When did PR happen? Who originated the term? What came through? And what are the stories? There are many stories about it. 
And as I say, you know, there've been um, two keen to revolve around the, the, the four stage theory of history, which is not good history and uh, is a very interested history, which is not declaring itself as an interested history. And I think the more we can pull out this, uh, it was shocking. I've recently been um, supervising a dyslexic and it was only in 2007 that New Zealand acknowledged dyslexia. And I realized to my shame for all my years of teaching, I have been very unfriendly towards dyslexic through ignorance. And I think part of this, if um, we had historically managed to include neurodivergency, then we can include it in uh, contemporary organizations and contemporary business. And this is major because many of the leading entrepreneurs are either dyslexic or on the spectrum. And 70% of the Britain's spying force is actually on the spectrum because they have different perspectives. And against the um, incestuous nature of much PR, I'm very keen we find ways to get different perspectives in. So I hope my um, speedy tour through history and historical covers will help you to look at virtual histories with a view to changing and also taking a look at what kind of society you want to live in and how you can hack into history to get the story to change that. Thank you very much for your attendance and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, who wants to start us off? I will. Please do. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. I really liked it. I, I enjoyed the provocation, even though I, I, I disagree with it. I found your statement about all history being false reminded me of Baudrillard's, some of the sort of the Gulf War did not take place and Derrida's, there's nothing beyond the text. And uh, But I, get, I guess that's why it's there. Um, I do have a question, but my, my question goes to when you're uh, re-examining the history of PR, do you need to make greater distinction between examining the practice and profession of PR as opposed to paradigm shifts within scholarship? So I guess there are two types of history that overlap but are distinct, and that is, you know, the contest of ideas, uh, which is tied to, you know, generations of scholars within academia and resource power tied to certain universities and the ability to produce those discursive formations that you were talking about, as opposed to uh, a history of practitioners and how we've spoken about this in other, um, you know, Sydney seminars, how PR, for instance, came to Australia through General Douglas MacArthur during World War II and his media advisors came here. So there's a very interesting history story to be told there. So I'm wondering, you know, do you approach these two dimensions to, to retelling the past differently or can you use this same sort of uh, deconstructive approach for both? Okay, I'll say it's a both and but I wouldn't quite get out of that. But I think um, the emphasis is more on the historiography because what counts as public relations? I mean, when you look at a textbook, public relations, the assumption is it's corporate public relations. If it's not for profit public relations, it has a, a thing before. And I think public relations has belonged outside public relations for a long time. So I think, as you try to decide, if you say it's PR practitioners, you skew it towards government and corporates immediately. And, you know, there's activist public relations, but that's like a subsection. That's not the mainstream. So I think, I think you've certainly, there needs to be a lot more research done. But I think that's where people were, when I started in history, that's where people were going. And I think now we're starting to look at the historiography. We're trying to look at, well, what is history? What does it do? How do we know this? And, you know, the, just the very difficulty of what is public relations? Public relations is fought over. You know, whoever says what is public relations has got a powerful tool. Yeah. You know, and or is it just a tool? So I think that 
Uh, thanks for your kind, generous comments. But I think it's definitely a both and. And my personal preference is that um, we need maybe a bit less detail and a bit more expansion about, you know, like MacArthur wasn't, you know, that was a relatively late inclusion into the understanding of PR in Australia. Do you know what I mean? It didn't exist as a historical fact until someone argued it. Yeah, they unearthed it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you need to watch when you say unearthed it, you know, it wasn't actually buried. It was always, it was kind of hidden in plain sight, but no one saw it as important to the history of public relations. Mm. So it's a, a perceptual question, uh, although sometimes it, it is a, a, a finding. Thanks, that's... I thank you. Shima? Um, is there any connection between appreciative inquiry and virtual histories of PR? Uh, can I be honest? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> what I wanted to do was make sure, I heard that some of my friends and colleagues internationally and, and leading scholars were coming, and I wanted to try and make sure I got something for the, the students in there. I think there is an attitude to life in it, which carries over, so that I look at history looking to see uh, what's positive in it that I can use to make change. So, but you've caught me out, you know. Trust the student to show the emperor's got no clothes. David, can I ask a question? It's Bray, by the way. Yeah. Um, how, you know, if we go with the paradox, which I know we've contested a little bit in our discussion that everything, you know, everyone is lies, PR are lies, how do we construct a history that's not lies? Well, I don't. I mean, that was a bit of an exaggeration. I know. Also, also is it true. But it's to, to break out from this that it's just about finding the facts. It's actually less important finding. You know, that MacArthur's bringing of PR over was known before it entered PR history, before someone realised that. So you, delete, you must, you know, be as transparent as possible, see where your sources are, where you're getting that from and through there. And then you must honestly say how you're shaping the story. Mm. You know, and I shape the story for pro-social. You know, I'm perfectly upfront. I think um, Grunig and his predecessors um, shaped the story to promote their PR. You know, it was very self-interested and uh, it ignored most history. And, and I, I think it's always been a method, but it's pity Jim's not here. He and I have argued about this before. I think it was a story to make PR people feel good about doing PR. And mm. there's a lot of PR people should not feel good about doing. And I think it'd be better to have that discussion rather than um, say, oh, we're all, we're all on uh, the golden ladder to uh, perfect dialogue and, um, symmetric communication. Does that help? So, you know, yes, you've got to get through, but it's more about how you're entering, where you're coming from, what you're doing, why you're using these sources, uh, and if possible, any sources that dispute it. So it, no. it's more a kind of self-reflexive. Um, that makes sense. I think though your comment is, is that we could, construct an, we could construct a number of different PR stories depending on who was writing the history. Yeah. What if um, Bernays' torches of freedom had been for uh, votes for women? You know, what if, you know, we could look at PR history and see some of the things. And sometimes it's good. What if PR had not pushed American entry into the Second World War? You know, America might not have gone. And the world would have been very different. So it's not always bad. But I think it's opening up the what if makes you, you, you look. And right now, when you're looking at whether there should be an intervention in Ukraine or not, you know, what are the arguments? Who's, it, who's putting it through? What are the perspectives? Because if you look at the past, it wasn't automatic. 
And if we look back, I think we can, and also most PR history is so fucking boring, you know, and, and really we should be much more exciting. But this is one of the things that's shaping the planet and let's shape it for good, but also let's entertain. Our ideas should be entertaining. We're in an economy where people need, they want fun, they want thing. We're in the Netflix time. So we should be doing more. We should be making our history fun and exciting. I think as you, if you look at a lot of this history, uh, uh, they use really attractive covers. They use um, ideas, they use puns. They're working, they're using the resources of, of discourse to get people involved in their arguments. Um, Jenny had a question. Her hand was like blended in with her wallpaper. I had trouble finding it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. It blends in with my kitchen background. Um, but I'm curious, Dave, I'm loving this idea of the contested and the paradox, but also of expanding beyond, like this idea of moving into the environment, the pro-social, all sorts of other things. But I think it raises a paradox for me, I guess, something I'd like to see how you feel about it, which is there's the telling of history from the voices that aren't yet heard. So when we look at this, it's who's doing the telling. We've got a lot of places around the world where we don't hear those voices yet. And it'd be great to see that. But is that then just taking another microscope and looking at another voice that comes in? How does that fit with your idea of looking more broadly at, at going out into the, the environmental, the social? How do you... How do you see that emerging or where we where that kind of work? I only say that I've been working with some people on the Arab Iraqi Middle Eastern story, history of PR, and it just blows my mind sometimes trying to figure out how do we tell that story and how do we translate it for the Western? Do we need to translate it? Do we help them tell their story? How do we do that? But I, that's, I guess, where I've been thinking. So it's like, um, Mitchell, it's a really good question, and I'm kind of sliding out with a both hands. You know, I mean, what's has happened is we've had a lot of national histories of PR, you know, and Marguerite and I have written one, you know, in, 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 in Israel. But we need to do that while being aware that the limitations of nationalism, you know, that nationalisms are, are a major factor in destroying the planet, while still wanting to allow Ukraine to be free, <laughs> if you see what I mean. So it's, I've lost you. There was a sudden switch. Can I, ah, there. Um, can, can I ask a yeah. ask question? Not a question, a, a suggestion. I think that uh, we can ask the Bashish, as long as he's here, uh, to say something about the concept of PR as resistance. This is his recent book with Priya Kurian, and I think that this is a very relevant idea that might contribute a lot. I'm always welcome to yield the floor to Debashish. <laughs> and you that's that's very kind of you, uh, Madli, to invite me to speak. But this is this is David's <laughs> lecture, and I, I I don't really want to um, to uh, to get into this. I'm, I mean, I find whatever David says very inspirational, anyway. So, um, but very briefly, yes. Um, so yeah, my new book called Public Relations and Sustainable Citizenship looks at um, public relations as, um, as a device for resistance rather than you know, promoting a particular point of view, but to actually question assumptions and resist um, you know, what are taken for granted ideas. Um, so you know, it'll take me a long time to, to really discuss it, but, uh, but thank you, Magali, for giving me the opportunity. Can, well, I just come you, in, can I just come in on that one? Because I think it's interesting. I don't think, when we decide what PR is, I suspect there's more resistance PR in the world than there is corporate PR. Yeah. But it's not known as resistance PR until you write a book on it <laughs> and it comes out and enters the discourse. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and yeah. this is why I think, you know, to answer Mitchell in a way, this is why, and also to come back to um, Jenny, you know, this is why this side is so important, because uh, we're constructing reality. You know, as we, as we construct the history, we're constructing the present reality, and we're making decisions as to what is possible. But to, to, just to finish, to, you know, there's a lot of national, and it's good to have a history of Thai PR, it's good to have African nations in PR, but if they're all stuck 
international thing, then we also need, we haven't had a big history of PR, which is PR for the planet, which is PR about how we came into being and how we can possibly survive. Now, uh, also the corporate PR side did a good job of promoting themselves as the only way public relations should be. You know, you look at Jim's work and Larissa's early work, they're constantly blaming activists for being a thorn in the sides of corporations as if what they were doing wasn't public relations. They were the, you know, they were the keepers of the, of the true public relations and they were just rabble rousers, but it misses the whole point. Like you just said, is that, is that there's probably more of that than there is at the corporate PR. And, and not setting it up as a, as a for and against corporate, not corporate. I think yeah. figuring out what it role they do play and has it has played in society more broadly is a very different way of framing it than being corporate or not corporate or organizational, not organizational. And I think that contention that of what organization is um, might also be something that we need to explore and why that's the focus. Yeah, I think that's critical. And I think it's worth looking at. The person who defines PR wins the game. If that regime of truth, you know, if that's PR, then what's not PR can be totally out of the field. You know, so that's why, you know, we, we can't and shouldn't define it. We're fighting for it. You know, Debashish, I think, in fighting for resistance PR, say that's the real PR. That's the PR that matters. So this is contested, but it, it, if you don't look as though it's contested, you know, if PR is assumed to be corporate PR, as Michael says, they've done a bloody good job that that's what PR is. And that's what most people think about within it. I think earlier to Bree's question and what you were saying is that is you suggested we look at historiography. The historiography is how we do history, not actually history. And there's a great deal to learn about how we tell those stories because the story we tell is different than what we decide about how to tell that story and what informs the telling of that story, which is I think what you've been saying. But you know, I had two historiography classes in you know, my PhD and you don't appreciate how much of history like just, just made up, you know, yeah. it's just created. Yeah, and now they're doing big history which you know they've got the history of the start of the planet you know when none of us could be there <laughs> um unless it's a theological one okay anyone else say uh, look i haven't heard from you i, I did have a follow-up if i could yeah. david it of seems course. like a lot of the history books I've actually I've read about PR have actually been written by journalists, uh, and they are not favourable, <laughs> favourably disposed to the profession. Uh, and as a result, their histories of PR focus all on the negatives. So Bernays and his connection to Joseph Goebbels, PR is toxic sludge. Um, and it makes me wonder to what extent history books written by PR scholars would be taken seriously given that reputational damage that's already been told about, uh, you know, the practice of public relations already. I sort of, I feel like the well's being poisoned uh, for the more favourable reception of a retelling of PR's history by PR scholars. I think in books, the activists have won the PR war. <laughs> Toxic Sludge has sold a lot more than uh, the Excellence Project. Um, and it was mu much more designed for that. But I think there's a problem with that. It's so dismissive. You know, and I come from a critical tradition and I've been at Sterling and I've spoken to the, the, the Sterling people about this. You know, that there's, there are some good factors there. I mean, I'm so glad the American PR got the US into the Second World War. We might live in a fa have gone into a fascist world without it, you know. So what we need is 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 more histories in a sense, and and each of them they, they also need to take account of each other, you know, in in, in a way that that's true. But I think uh, the um, and I think the non-fiction sphere has also played into PR's bad reputation. You know, everything from Sex in the City to 
um, utopia in uh, you know that so there's there's a, there's a, a wide set of discourses around and our part is actually a very modest little bit but I think it's important you know I think that more history comes from non-historians and historians but the historians work is vital and I would like to see public relations history being taken as seriously as that with the same vitality and importance. I don't know if that quite answers you, but. No, it does, thank you. Luke, did you have a question? Sure. Um, and this is a kind of a methodological question, I guess. Um, you know, David, having read some of your work, you know, I, I see in part this process of going out and finding ideas and pulling them back, right? So go, going in search of things that are outside of the realm of what we would usually see as, as part of public relations scholarship. And I guess I would ask to you, number one, what makes a good idea to use in that way? What, what's something that gets you excited or what aspects of that idea you know, would make it for you valuable for us to use? And what are some things that you've learned over the years of that going through that process of um, how to do that effectively, right? In terms of pulling those ideas back in in ways that you, you see as being useful and relevant and helpful for the rest of us as, as scholars? Well, I go back to literature. You know, there's, a, there's um, one of the English women novelists, whose name escapes me, said, reader, did the page move for you? <laughs> um, is it an idea that excites me? Like Debbie Sheesh mentioned, Ministry for the Future. I read it and this was speaking to me about the world how it is, how it could be changed. So I'm looking for something that has, and maybe there is a bit, uh, go back to Shima's one, uh, maybe there is a bit where um, appreciative inquiry, I'm looking for stuff that excites me, you know, but also fits with my purpose. You know, I want a better world. So I'm looking for progressive material that is exciting. That is, and I like to be entertained. You know, if you're reading the early PR histories, oh fuck, you know, you, you, it's like taking Valium. You know, the, that, that's an interesting point too that we've talked about before, Maureen, I think, and lots of us is that there are so many scholars who just study what their advisors studied and are just looking for an area that's easy to look at. And I have always said, like, why the, why the fuck would you want to waste your time on something so boring? You know, like, find something you care about and study that. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, I think there is a tendency to do it because you can get an area you can cover. And I think there's, there's a lot to be said in getting a detail. There, and there's many careers made on it. But I don't think at this point in time, at this point in the planet's history, that that's serving us too well and um and i don't find much of it exciting to put it mildly can i ask a question david of course does sorry ever, i didn't break this before um just um does it ever concern you that we're all talking amongst ourselves and most other disciplines have no interest or care about what we're talking about in public relations even though obviously public relations practitioners make a huge difference often in the world, even though it's often the unseen hand doing it? Yes, is the short answer. And uh, it's partly our own fault. I'm big on interdisciplinarity. But I mean, if it, uh, it's not a joke. You know, if you say that journalism is the first draft of history, then PR is influencing most journalism. It is now, yeah. You know, so I mean, historians should be... Uh, paying attention to us you know mm -hmm. it's it's one of the few one of the better history books is scott antony's who looked at the uh, grierson and the pr in britain where there was government pr and it was hi Kay, i haven't got back to you yet um it was a uh, it, it's one of the more solid ones which looks and it puts a wider context into it yeah. But um, yes, we are. I mean, if you are incestuous, incest is relatively interesting. But if you're outside, it's dead boring. You get into necrophilia. Um, you know, it really is uh, there. And 
And if we don't, you know, do the work ourselves, then they're very sniffy about it. You know, Margalit has to constantly fight to get PR taken seriously. That's a real problem within the academy. We're seen as a, a cash cow in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. And that has to be fought too. So we're, we're, we're acting on many fronts. But yes, I think we need to look at, um, at how we can impact onto other areas. Yeah, definitely. And there's, you know, there's even under research codes in Australia, public relations isn't, isn't just isn't there. You know, communication is, marketing is, but not public relations. So yeah, I think, but I think I was really inspired by that early part of your talk about actually trying to find the good and trying to find the, the positive in, in any experience. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, and if you look at the people who are here today who are having this conversation, this is not a common conversation in PR. And from conversation comes change. Good point. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. When, when I look at public relations history, I always end up looking at in relation to another discipline's history. For example, yeah. if I'm looking at public relations in the context of development, then I need to look at development's history. When I'm looking at uh, public relations history in the context of corporations, then I look at it in, in relation to corporate's history. So is there a way of making it an independent discipline, public relations becoming an independent discipline and with not having these you know, contextual expectations attached to the discipline? Is it do, you think, do you think that would be a good idea? I mean, I'm just uh, thinking aloud. I don't know. I mean, yeah. No, I mean, I don't think you understand something. Uh, I, I, and, and, you know, until you've looked at other things and history is very capacious, you know, uh, it's like I learned a lot from looking at history of marketing. I think marketing history has got some advances on us. I think international relations history has got a lot of advances on us. You know, so you look and see, and I'm a, um, a, as a, Luke said, I, I steal from anywhere that's good. <laughs> you know, if there's something that's good, I get in and steal. But you, you can't see public relations history unless you also see marketing history, political history. You need to have a context to see what's unique about it and to see what's the same as everything else. So from that perspective, there could be multiple histories of public relations? Yes, there should be, can and should be. Okay, thank you. Good question, thanks. Anybody else? Okay, well we're we're getting close to noon, so here in a, here in Sydney. So why don't we uh, last chance wrap it up? We have a good. Okay, then I'm going to stop recording, and if anybody has any secret comments they want to share, now is the time.